Well, good day, everyone, and welcome uh, to an FS Club uh, seminar. This Today's seminar is being done with the Financial Services Group of Livery Companies, and we're going to be talking about anti-money laundering. Financial Services Group of Livery Companies created an anti-money laundering task force to support a theme that I and my brother, Sheriff Chris Hayward, have supported, which is strengthening and simplifying anti-money laundering procedures in the UK against a somewhat rhetorical uh, and challenging question, if Britain is open for business, try opening a bank account. And I think that's the important theme today is we're going to explore uh, what the current state is of anti-money laundering and what can be done about it. I have put uh, this picture up, uh, not normally, as you know, those of your FS club, but uh, merely to show you in full share of regalia. Uh, but today we're going to be going uh, through uh, three other people who are going to chat uh, Graham Gordon is going to come on and introduce the task force. Um, Heather uh, Bressist will be chatting about it from the Institute of Taxation perspective. And Mark Spalforth will be talking about it uh, for managing uh, an accountancy practice. So we've got quite a bit of ground to cover today. There will be time for a panel discussion. And I would encourage you to use the question facility provided by GoToWebinar uh, to send questions to me, which I will field uh, to our panelists. As ever, I have to thank our sponsors, without whom none of this would be possible. And we really appreciate your generosity and are conscious that many of you provide services and solutions for anti-money laundering or are, in many cases, involved in anti-money laundering procedures and bureaucracy yourself. Now, I like to point out that we, within the uh, FS Club community, have been involved for many years uh, at looking at anti-money laundering. I point often to this report from uh, 2003, looking at anti-money laundering uh, requirements, costs, benefits, and perceptions. Sadly, I would argue that uh, nearly two decades on, this report is still valid. It's an ineffective, costly uh, process, somewhat anti-competitive, where very little feedback is given to people. Uh, but we think uh, that there's some hope that a, a confluence of a number of things might be pointing to changes in this regime, and that's what our panel will be looking at today. The FSG also helped uh, us to start a small survey on anti-money laundering uh, perceptions. It's a continuously running survey, uh, and details will be available on the website after this, but we've had 2,274 responses in the last six months. And what has been intriguing with COVID 19 has been that the respondents who had earlier put down uh, government digital certificates, so that's the provision of digital certificates for government documentation, be it personal documentation such as a driver's license or an import export certificate, has climbed quite significantly uh, since the lockdown. And you might say somewhat understandably, as you wish to see an efficient system that doesn't rely on people physically having to attend or physically having to get uh, notary certificates for various pieces of documentation. So there is some change going on. Anyway, we'll come to that uh, during the discussion. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to the chairman of the Financial Services Group of Livery Companies Anti-Money Laundering Task Force, Graham Gordon. Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, I, I want to first thank the FSG uh, for putting me here and for allowing us to talk about this uh, subject. If I can move to the next slide, please, Michael. Uh, I, I have uh, I run a, an international organization uh, with, in 111 countries uh, with uh, people who are quite keenly involved in uh, anti-money laundering across the world. And it's always a, a bone of contention when people uh, come to this country uh, to try and uh, do business exactly as Michael said earlier, where they want to um, they want to start a business, they want to do it, and they say that's all. We say that's all easy, but you try getting a bank account, and of course that's even more so. When we started this whole process, it was because of Brexit and one or two other things that are happening. COVID nineteen has taken that into a whole new ball game, uh, as we'd say. And of course, now we we have a, an economic situation that was totally unprecedented when we started this whole process. So the intention of the task force 
is to strength to try to uh, assist people in the concept of strengthening and simplifying the anti-money laundering throughout the, uh, the UK, but particularly within the city, so that the city of London is open for business post-COVID uh, and post-Brexit. We, with that, we are engaging with major financial institutions and said here. We're, also, we're talking to them. At the end of the day, if we can get them to understand the areas that need uh, reviewing or revising, then that is that will be a win as far as we're concerned. Um, the anti-money laundering procedures need to be reviewed. As We had a previous webinar where the young lady from Monza explained how they were able to s overcome the anti-money laundering issues and still be uh, perfectly valid in inspecting the, uh, the new clients came on board. And yet, you try and explain that to some of our more um, material or long longer-term banks, and they go, to tick bo they go to tick boxes and what we would call CYA, just covering their bums and making sure that they, uh, they cover the themselves by getting all these boxes ticked and not actually paying attention to who the people are and what the process is. So if we can galvanize these trade bodies, the banks and all the others into supporting this initiative and to promoting it and putting it forward, then we will uh, we will have succeeded. Uh, we, As Michael explained, uh, I'm part of the FSG, part of the Financial Services Group of Livery Companies. And we have got uh, a number of webinars and such. So, Michael, if you change the slide, please, you'll see that we have got these um, ideas going forward. Now, I apologize in advance that there are some TBDs down here, but you can uh, hopefully appreciate with COVID going the way it is, we are still uh, working out exactly when to do what, but we will make sure uh, everyone on this call and everyone listening gets plenty of notice. And with that, I therefore would like to pass on to my uh, next the speaker uh, and we'll pass across, if I may, to Heather. Heather, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, I'm Heather Bressest. I'm Head of Professional Standards at the Chartered Institute of Taxation. And along with 21 other professional bodies, we are government-appointed AML supervisors. And then there are further three, um, the FCA, HMRC, and the Gambling Commission. And I thought it might be of interest to you to hear about AML from a supervisor's perspective. There's too much detail in my slides, so I'm just going to pick out a couple of points from, from each. I think the major source of information for us as supervisors is probably the Accountancy Affinity Group, which is all the accountancy supervisors and this AML Supervisors Forum, where all the supervisors come together, along with the Home Office, Treasury, um, the National Crime Agency, and FIU. And that gives us a steer as to what government is expecting from supervisors. It gives us a chance to express our views, but how much that's taken into consideration, maybe a moot point, um, and what trends and what, what do they see as happening down the line or anything that we should be alerted to. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Now, I think for any of you who are supervised, I think you will have noticed over the last few years a distinct change in your supervisor's approach. Um, I think early days we took a fairly light hands, uh, touch, a, a very softly, softly touch, but that has changed. And I think that was as a result of the national risk assessments of 2015 and 2017 when they considered that the accountancy sector uh, provided a high risk of money laundering. Now, there was no granularity about how they came to that decision, um, and neither did they distinguish between professionally qualified accountants and those without a qualification or without membership of a professional body. Um, it also identified a lack of consistency and approach by the supervisors, and I think the government were quite worried. They saw the uh, FATF Financial Action Task Force um, visit coming up in early 2018. And so to address those points, they set up the Office for Professional Body um, Anti-Money Laundering Supervisors. 
And could I have the next slide, please? I think for any of you who were involved in the FATF inspection, you will know how much hard work went into the preparation for that. Endless amounts of work for the supervisors. But it paid off because um, the UK got a glowing report. Except again, they pointed out that there were weak, they believed there were weaknesses in the legal and accountancy sector. Now we felt that was a bit unfair. You might say we would say that, wouldn't you? But um, they spoke to, I think, two of the accountancy supervisors, and there are about 11, 12 of us, maybe even more, uh, and they spoke to them for about half a day. So we weren't sure. We think there was an element of FATF had a suspicion that the professional bodies find it difficult to distinguish between their role as a professional body trade association, as they see it, and then an AML enforcer. But they did say they had, there was no evidence for that. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So what has the impact of OPBUS been? Well, I think um, they came and visited all the supervisors. They spent three days with us. And then they sent every supervisor a letter outlining their failings. There was nothing to say, well, you're doing a good job here. Keep doing that. But these are the points you have to address. It was all very negative, which was a bit dispiriting. But I think the main things that came out of that was all supervisors were had to ramp up their enforcement action. Um, and the sanctions had to be rigorous, um, they had to be proportionate, effective and dissuasive. And the message was clearly, currently, they are not. Um, so if you've seen a change in your supervisor's approach, that is why. And of course, there are high costs involved with um, having op bus, which have to be passed on to the supervised population. I think, um, could I have the next slide, please? I think what might make it better for us and for your supervised population is better information coming from uh, the authorities. We're told you're not reporting enough in SARS, but they don't tell us what we should be reporting, what we're missing that they think we should be reporting. Um, we know the huge amount of detail that's held by the FIU. Um, I've been to a presentation where they've shown a square, a square mile and said, those red dots there, those are where the SARS have been made from that from that building. Those other dots are the subjects of those SARS. So it shows you how much information is held, and I appreciate there are good reasons why you can't disclose all of that, but some more information coming from the authorities would help us do our job very much better. And finally, just um, a quick word about Europe and to show the UK is so diligent in getting MLD directives in place, or were, pre-Brexit, and look at what Europe, the rest of Europe does. Eight member st states still have not implemented 5MLD, and a year after the implementation for 4MLD, 20 member states have not implemented it, and what sanctions were imposed. I'll now pass over to Mark. Thank you, Heather. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, you'll have seen my uh, CV posted for this event, but I just wanted to uh, expand a bit by saying that although I'm now a partner in a, a fairly large um, partnership, Crest and Rees, we have about 50 partners and we are uh, international because we are members of the Crest and Worldwide Group. My, my real experience over 35 years has been with a much smaller firm, my family firm, um, which had uh, about 10 partners, 10 million turnover. Um, and I'm the result of a genetic breeding program for chartered accountants in that both my grandfathers were chartered accountants, father, two uncles, brother, cousin, you can just keep going. Um, it's a family business. And so our family business tends to get clients who are well known to us, local, um, and uh, we know all about them. So we weren't too worried about the money, anti-money laundering legislation when it came along, although I was quite involved with it um, when I was president of the Institute. We, we thought that... Uh, it was a very important thing to, to bring in, but it probably didn't affect us as a, as a family firm too much. I've also had a, a lot of interest in deregulation, or what I've been trained to call better regulation, um, in that I was involved with da David Cameron's uh, red tape challenge, uh, where we managed to make sure that he left office with less laws on the statute book than when he came in. I think that's the first time that's ever happened. And I also worked with the International Federation of Accountants to on a project to look and see what good regulation looks like. And 
the first slide here tells you pretty much what, um, in, in various different areas around the world, what a good regulatory scheme uh, should consist of, what it should look like. Now, as I say, I'm not going to go through uh, the this, this slides in this detail, but I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of where I have problems in my practice and uh, perhaps relate them back to failures in, in meeting these uh, particular uh, detailed uh, uh, descriptions of what good regulation looks like. Now, a year ago, I, um, I met Karen Baxter, who is the police officer who is the national lead on economic crime. Um, and I, the reason I met her was I was interested in standing for our local police and crime commissioner uh, role. So I attended a, a seminar on the future of policing. And we, we discussed money, anti-money laundering. And, and she pretty bluntly told me that the accountancy profession sends in far too few suspicious activity reports. Only about 1% or 2% come from my profession. That I should be doing something about it rather than moaning about the bureaucracy of the regulations. Um, I was slightly taken aback by this. And I responded rather lamely, I think, by explaining that, well, you know, we have many less, far smaller client account movements than lawyers. So if you wanted to move a lot of money around, you wouldn't use an accountancy practice. And in any case, if a criminal wanted to launder money, why would he come to a, a qualified and registered firm rather than one of the other sort of 100,000 uh, people offering accountancy services? But I don't want to minimize the problem. I, I, I absolutely understand that we've got a significant issue here. I think the latest estimates were uh, $2 trillion around the world, and, and they reckon that, um, you know, £100 billion pounds worth of money laundering through the UK. And, and London is seen as the centre of the global money laundering, uh, which is used for terrorist financing, the drug trade, and uh, for general criminality. So there are clear objectives here in, in the public interest uh, to develop uh, uh, a system that reduces the level of crime. But my feeling, as it already been expressed, is that there's actually little evidence that the regulation has had a, a noticeable impact on, on the level of money laundering and, and yet it's imposed an enormous burden on us uh, in, the, in the profession and, and on the banks. I mean, the, the British Bankers Association reckons that the cost uh, is about four billion a year in admin costs for the banks alone. And it doesn't seem to me to be uh, proportionate or, or focused. It's also given me a problem in terms of uh, uh, I can't get the brightest and the best students to be accountancy students when they have to spend their time dealing with, with admin pushing paper and, and ticking boxes. I, I, I lost quite a good person uh, about a year ago who simply said he was fed up with, with doing this kind of work. And that's not all the fault of the regulations. And I understand that. Um, uh, it can equally be blamed on, on very risk averse top management. Um, but I do think that the system is, is broken and, uh, and ineffective. And actually, Michael, if you just go back again to the previous uh, uh, statement, uh, previous slide, I, I think that the problem is that we don't have the proportionate and balanced um, regulation. It's not cooperative and it's not consistent. And those are the three areas I think we, we have a problem here. And I'm going to give you a few examples of the problems that I deal with in practice. But before I do that, I, I think there really is a standoff here between the regulators and, and the regulated. The banks de-risk because they have enormous fines coming through, and they do that by the hiring compliance officers who don't have any responsibility for the commerciality of, of what they're putting in place. The compliance officer runs a, a risk of a two-year prison term if he gets it wrong, and he's given complete carte, carte blanche to impose a, a culture and a framework um, that costs the bank, and more importantly, their customer base, enormous amounts of money. Uh, but I don't think management ever sit down and work out what the cost benefit is. Um, they just ask for no mistakes ever. Um, but we can never eliminate risk. And, and the problem is that the cost of trying to eliminate risk rise logarithmically as we try to squeeze out the, the, the smallest risks. And, and that's the, the difficulty. And I want to remind everybody that, that there's nothing in the directives that actually tells banks what information they have to get from people who they're taking on as a new client. There's nothing in the regulation that tells me what my firm has to get. Uh, and so um, that's why all the banks have different lists of regulation and why I think um, we have a problem internally as well in terms of perhaps overdoing uh, the regulation. So a couple of examples. I'm, I'm a, a trustee of a family trust that's uh, put in place to make sure a, a family farm uh, survives through the next two generations, and we need a bank account. 
The Lloyds Bank have taken over a year to deal with this, and I still don't have a bank account. They can't decide whether a trust is um, a business or whether it's a personal bank account. And in any case, trusts are on a list of being relatively high risk, so they have to ask all sorts of questions. Because I understand that people use international trusts to hide beneficial ownership, but in this case, we know exactly who owns it, we know exactly what it's there for, and we know exactly what, what the assets are. But you can't go into a local branch and talk to somebody about this because they have specialist people, so you have to arrange an appointment where they send their regional person down to the bank, uh, and I have to go in and, and see them and sit down and charge the client for doing that. And at one point, we were all asked to go together, these trustees who are spread across the county, to go all together into Lloyds Bank to sit and watch a video about the banking relationship and about the problems that they might have with money laundering. I mean, it's just completely um, uh, ridiculous, really. And secondly, I'll, I'll talk about our own internal onboarding uh, issue. We, it currently costs us about £800 to £1,000 to, um, to take on a new client. And if I'm going to take on a client for a tax return of perhaps a four or £500 fee, that's going to take me five or six years to get that cost back again uh, for uh, starting up a client. And remember, these are these are local clients. I've probably been to their house. I probably know them pretty well. I certainly know their, 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 their local um, relationships and how they fit into society. Um, and if I was to be able to use my professional judgment, I'd know very well who were likely um, to be involved in any money laundering or not. And the answer is, 99.9% .9 of my clients are never going to be involved with that at all. Then finally, Gold, Goldman Sachs is another good example. Um, I'm an executor with a, a, a client uh, for his wife. And the wife died last year. Uh, the client is fairly elderly, doesn't have a mobile phone, he doesn't have an email address. So Goldman Sachs cannot recognize anybody who doesn't live in the modern world with an email address and a mobile phone. So they would only talk to me. Now, I have a professional problem with that because I'm not allowed to be able to give instructions on my own without some cover. My professional body says that that is risky and dangerous for me to be able to give instructions on my own. So it's taken us seven months to get the money out of Goldman Sachs and to be able to, to finish off the probate. And I could go on. I mean, powers of attorney throw a bank into a complete panic. Um, you can't get hard copy bank statements or anything anymore to be able to take to a new bank. Uh, and opening bank accounts for uh, elderly clients is, is a nightmare, as it can be for for students, people from abroad. We had a trouble problem with a, a transgender reassignment person where you know, the bank can't understand that somebody who is a woman has become a man and vice versa. But a lot of my clients don't have a current passport or a current driving license. They might live in a care home and not have utility bills. And so the lists that the banks put in place in their framework are simply don't apply in a, in a lot of cases. And, and it's unfortunately, it's going to be um, those people who are uh, perhaps in, in the most difficult situation who are going to be um, hit hardest by the, the poor regulation. So what would I suggest we do? Um, I think the, uh, the framework has to be much more consistent, especially in the identification process. I think we have to go back to embedding some kind of judgment and thought in the system. You know, the paradox is that the tick box functions actually reduce the amount of thought that people put into the process and the effort they, they put into identifying risks. I think we have to, have to properly uh, survey, survey the costs and, and quantify the impact of the, the bureaucracy. And I think we have to use some people who are actually involved in the front line to design the systems, not, uh, not a lot of independent uh, management who perhaps are, are ignorant of, of what the issues. And on a bigger scale, I absolutely understand that we have a, a, a big problem. And I think the country has to invest a lot more in the, in the UK Financial Intelligence Unit uh, to really identify the, the big players in this, in this area, and have to focus a bit more on international transactions, perhaps. And I think we have to share information a lot better between public, private, uh, law enforcement, and the supervisory bodies. I don't think you can solve this problem and identify the issues if we don't talk about it and use real case studies and, and real examples. So I, I absolutely understand the issue. Um, it's causing me a nightmare, though, in my small local practice. And somewhere along the line, we have to improve the system, uh, work out what the impact is of, of uh, 
what we're doing at the moment and whether we are actually having any effect on the final criminality that we're all trying to, to suggest. So that's me. Um, back to um, uh, Michael, I think, who's got some questions, uh, and we'll see how we get on. Uh, Michael, I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else can. Sorry, my apologies. Thank you. Um, yeah, just taking myself off mute there. Uh, yeah, we uh, we put together some questions, and I I want to thank uh, Mark, uh, Heather, and uh, Graham for warming us up here. Um, it would appear to me that the first two questions here, uh, how do AML procedures and regulations affect a professional firm, as well as uh, does AML bureaucracy worsen trade and revenue, are, are fairly clear. Are they uh, the procedures are at the moment expensive and onerous and impeding business. Is there, is there a fair agreement on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, then I think we could probably spend a bit more time on, on the subsequent four. Um, I'm kind of curious uh, if you go way back to uh, the 9 11, which uh, accelerated this push and brought in the idea that uh, terrorist funding was, was coming via people circumventing uh, decent procedures. Um, we saw immediately there uh, net economy and search space as being two systems uh, put forward, autonomy, etc. And it appears to me that every time I get into this at some level, technology comes up. Uh, but Mark, you were talking about really using judgment, which I was saying te technology can't uh, evades judgment. But do the three of you have thoughts on what are the limits to what we can achieve technologically? But if I shoot off there, uh, Michael, because I think Mark has uh, touched on it, um, I, I'm a technophile. I'm, I'm uh, all in favor of technology. But I think the trouble is there is, as all technology, it's who compiles it in the first place. I mean, it could just fall into the category of being another set of tick boxes. You know, have you got this? Have you attached that? Have you attached the other thing? Uh, technology um, can be uh, an aid, but as you said, and I think it's Mark it, it, it certainly inferred earlier, uh, without the judgment, without someone actually intervening and getting to know who the individual is who's doing the work, or, or maybe already knows who the individual is doing the work, without that level of uh, interaction and human uh, judgment, then I think technology is irrelevant. I, I think the uh, the problem is the behaviour that uh, technological um, interventions uh, cause in the people who are trying to make this assessment. You know, we we have a system now that you run through a lovely algorithm that uh, three or four people sitting in a room worked out for the average way that we take on a new client. But unfortunately, people are individuals; they have individual ways of doing things. And uh, as soon as you step outside the algorithm, you're in trouble. And that's the trouble with the banks as well. As soon as you step outside the normal trading uh, relationship that, that somebody has, they, they don't know how to cope. They haven't got local people who know how to cope. And so rejection is the, is the de-risking uh, alternative. I could, when I take on a new client, I could sit down with a sheet of A4 paper and absolutely say why I think this person is low risk, medium risk, or high risk, having thought about it. I have people who will sit down with an algorithm who come up with completely the wrong answer, um, having ticked all the boxes, because they simply haven't thought about it. You know, if there's somebody who's come in from the Ukraine and wants to take us on as a, a client, I want to know why they want to come to us rather than go to an international firm. You know, wh why, why, why do they think us? Um, uh, and, and I think that's the difficulty. It, it's a, it creates that lack of thought, the behavior that it, it brings in, is 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 against the the main purpose of the algorithm in the first place. I I think in some ways, uh, and I, I agree with you both. Uh, I think um, electronic ID, though, for smaller practices, has helped. Um, the feedback from members is that it's it's helped them the clarification that that's acceptable. But of course, you still need a fair degree of skepticism because electronic ID will tell you about the person whose name has been put forward, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that the person who has said, given their name details, is actually that person. You know, 
you, I think it's a good idea to use technology like Skype or Zoom or Microsoft Teams to to be able to see the person. So you can, I suppose, look into the right and check that way as well. So, you know, that those pretty routine elements of technology, I think, have helped. But where you get, as you say, there does need to be an element of common sense um, thrown in there as well. Uh, yeah, it's I think a comment that, that, sorry, Michael. It's, it's, I yeah, it's say. a comment that Beth Rudolph here is making as well. She's saying uh, in a COVID environment, you don't want to be seeing documents anyway uh, and you know, really need to use electronic verification. Uh, even if it's uh, even if they don't have a passport or driving license, NHS, uh, NI, uh, and some sort of digital footprint, it might cost you ten quid, but but it saves you time. But then she points out immediately afterwards, on top of ID verification, of course, uh, you've got to look at the substance of the transaction. But you know, is, is there a real real future there? Sorry, Graham. I was just going to actually you said exactly what the, your speaker was going to say. Uh, as just said, you know, the technology is a good tool. And in COVID circumstances, both as Heather and the uh, young lady you were just referring to said, yeah, it allows you to verify who the individual is or should allow you to. But without the professional skepticism of actually, you know, as Mark said, you know, come in from Ukraine and you want to use uh, a, a small a South Coast firm rather than KPMG or whomsoever in the city, um, there may well be a perfectly practical and sensible reason for it, but you've got to look in and make sure it is a practical and sensible reason and not a way that they think they can uh, circumvent the rules. So professional skepticism is going to be paramount at all times. Yeah, uh, can I just say that the uh, the FATF and, and um, CCAB, which is the, uh, the Consultative Committee of Accountancy Bodies, have produced some nice reports with case studies that identify the flags, the red flags that we all ought to be looking out for. Now, those red flags are not generally built into these systems. Um, and I think that we, if we had a proper feedback and cooperative relationship with the regulators, we could build up a bank of case studies of where things have gone wrong and where we can stop them going wrong in the future, rather than, than being very theoretical about it. I was turned down for some for a, a small credit arrangement I wanted to enter into uh, three months ago because my name was not on the, um, the, the the list at the local council for for council tax because I didn't want it particularly on there. Um, and so because my details weren't on there, I clearly wasn't credit worthy. Um, you know, and, and somebody somewhere has to work out um, what are the red flags and what aren't the red flags. Yeah. Well, um, might might move along on to the the bit here about the state in the UK. You know, are we really gold plated or or just inefficient? Um, and uh, I've got a couple of comments here. Uh, Bob McDowell is dialing in from the Channel Islands, and he's curious what impact, if any, do the panel think Brexit will have on AML regulation? And Hugh Purser makes an interesting point that the panel refer largely to individuals uh, in the time available, but much of this is actually being done effectively by uh, professional organized criminals uh, running as a business. So how much focus should there be really more on business in the context of today's discussion than individuals? Um, you know, Heather, do you want to pick that one up? Um, well, the, in terms of um, individuals versus com companies, um, that's a point that uh, supervisors, professions have made repeatedly to the government that anybody can set up a company at the, at the drop of hat. Now, I know there were some proposals to, to change that, but that really, you know, companies, company formation has been seen as a risk area for a very long time, but it still seems to be a, ve a good vehicle with, with which to um, start up your money laundering operation. Um, so I, I, I think there is more focus on it now, but it's still an area that needs development. I'm sorry, I can't remember what the first part of the question was. Oh, it was, it was more about Brexit and uh, oh, AML. Well, I, I don't think, well, I go to um, a, a European body that's for all the tax professional bodies in, in Europe. And we talk quite a lot about uh, anti-money laundering. And the, the, the proposal that we'll have a new super European supervisor and a, a a rule book for all um, ML in, in Europe. Of course, we won't be 
bound by, by that. But I think because it's a global uh, matter, ML, I, I don't see us relaxing ML in any way anytime soon. And I think probably what happens in Europe will gradually make its way across to the UK. And if it's not Europe, it'll be through FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. Um, I think so I don't my answer to that is I don't see it changing. I think we will still either gold plate or be very close to gold plating any AML developments. Well could could we go further? Sean Turnbull is uh looking at this from Australia. Would any of the presenters support disclosure of the ultimate beneficial owners of any publicly traded company to identify not just insider trading but the use of share transfers for money laundering? Uh, because that was a Cameron proposal, was it not, Mark? Yes, it was, and and I think that the um, you know, the layering that can go on with money laundering uh, by putting a, a, a company or a trust in place is the big issue, and, it, and it's very difficult to deal with. Um, so we do have to now with with the trust register, we have to identify all the beneficiaries. But you know, it's quite difficult if you have a discretionary trust with. Uh, a very big uh, number of potential beneficiaries, and usually um, in a family situation, you don't want those beneficiaries necessarily to know that they are potential beneficiaries. Um, they're going to blow all the money. Um, so there's a big difference here between, uh, I think, international trusts, where the Americans have been uh, really at the forefront of forcing everybody to, um, to come up with a list of potential beneficiaries. And I think the... Um, the, the, the company's house list of uh, interested people and beneficiaries is a lot better than it was, but I think it's probably right. Eventually, we will have to be able to stop people from hiding behind uh, very complex corporate structures, which don't appear to have any good um, economic reason for, for being in place. And I think that actually part of, part of the problem we have in the UK and in London particularly is that we have a very large and successful financial centre, which has complex financial products which which can be used to help to launder the money. So it, it is a, um, a focus for those people who are trying to uh, get their money around. And I think we ha also have traditionally very close relationships with the overseas territories and crown dependencies and places where um, that sort of information about beneficial ownership is not as uh, as open and, uh, and uh, available. Uh, so I think I think we do have a particular issue in London because of that. And I suspect we will have to move further in that direction. And I'm all for that, but don't let it affect the day-to-day, -day, you know, smaller individuals. Mm. And of course, uh, and then me, Peter Eowyn uh, points out the opposite on this one, that personal safety and financial privacy, both online and offline, is a major issue uh, for individuals who are indeed, a, you know, particularly the ultra-high net worth, who are an important part of our uh, financial real estate and luxury economies. Um, so... How does one maintain, you know, pr proper financial privacy and protection for them, particularly if we're looking at uh, attracting that type of business? So there's a, there's a constant sort of problem here, isn't there, between uh, the easy ideas of complete transparency and, um, and genuine concerns about safety. Any thoughts on that? If I may, I think the, the answer is yes, there is a, there is a, um, a dichotomy there the, there is a, a slight conflict but it's not i don't see that really a, a, as uh, the rationale for doing anything that much different uh, than, than what we're, we're compiling because if someone is a high net worth individual extreme high net worth individual and we want them to come in they we want them to be able to do business uh, easily going back to the very first point you made michael if they're going to do business here, we want them to have a bank account here so we can do all the rest of it and we can go through it. And there is, a, I keep coming back to professional skepticism, but it is, you know, are they here for a genuine reason, et cetera, or is there, you know, are they ultra, the, the ultimate beneficiary of a complex process which has no, as Mark said, has no real financial rationale behind it except to, to hide or to uh, uh, prevent people finding out what's going on. And therefore, I think that that is where a, a human being will come in. But if I can also address one of the questions you've got down here specifically, and it's sort of uh, uh, was uh, alluded to earlier, um, is the UK really gold plated? Is AML? Well, yes and no is my answer. It's it's a good system. I think it's not just gold, uh, gold plated. It's actually been quite well. Where I think the issue is. And we've all addressed it, we've all uh, mentioned this, 
is the implementation by certain entities, particularly banks, but not exclusively banks, is they've, they've taken it above and beyond. You know, and the compliance officer, I'm an ex-compliance officer of a merchant bank. So, you know, I, I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, right, uh, where, where do we go from here? Now, it, it, yes, I could tick the boxes, but you have to, if you're taking this uh, on someone on who's going to uh, use your system for uh, buying and selling shares legitimately, etc., you've got to use your skepticism, your, your professional uh, abilities and the way you're trained to go through it and say, this person appears, uh, I would give you know majority of things, this is okay, that this person is not okay. There, we are going to make mistakes. And by just having um, tick boxes or what have you, you're not going to get around the mistakes. The mistakes are going to be greater. I think it is inefficient. That's the word you've got down here. I think the inefficiencies are built in by the concept of tick boxing, by the concept of not using skepticism, not using all of the systems there. You can't do it all on professional skepticism. You can't do it all on tick boxing. But, you know, we've gone so far one way uh, and we've, we've forgotten the one, one area where, you know, this country is really good on, and that is the, the professionals who are trained, the, the level of professional training, it, whether you're a chartered accountant or a chartered tax advisor or whatever, that level uh, is not being sufficiently uh, looked into and the inefficiencies are coming in. Graham, I, I, I have to disagree. I think we have gold-plated quite a lot of the regulations. If you it comes back to the point about good regulation being consistent. If we are not consistent across the EU in those people who are covered by the regulation. So I, I think I'm right in saying that even uh, horse auctions in the UK are covered and they're not covered elsewhere in the EU. Well, why? You know, what, what is it so it's different about England uh, compared to France? Um, and, and I think we need to be careful about what the legislation is actually saying. One of the things I do think could be done much better is that any guidance that comes out to lawyers, accountants, and everybody else should clearly distinguish between what is the legal requirement and what is just good practice. And, and I don't think we ever do that. Um, and, and it's part of, you know, if you go to a lecture about it, the lecturer's job is almost to frighten you, so you take them on as a consultant and fix things afterwards. Um, and, and it's very difficult for the average person who, frankly, you know, we're all trying to get our chargeable hours in and do the work day to day. We don't want to have to work out for ourselves what is the legal uh, requirement and, and what is nice to have. And I think that's why we don't get the consistency that, that we need uh, across across the board. I should probably point out to the audience that uh, Mark has an equally uh, ornate photograph of himself uh, and speaking as a county sheriff <laughs> in the past. Naturally, he focuses on the horse auctions. <laughs> so I think, I think that's super. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time, uh, but the board is a bit lit up. And I think there's a, an interesting bit here. Uh, Calvin Wilson, Michael Levy, and a couple of others are really, I think, pointing out that one of the difficulties here with the tick box approach is that you're not really getting that dialogue going uh, about cases. Um, Michael Levy says, should we be using the term red flags so much? Shouldn't they really mostly be amber flags? Uh, and, and then th that falls into the judgment. And I myself, uh, I have one of the difficulties in these processes that uh, people talk about cost benefit analysis, but you can't do it. There's just far too much political influence on the scale of the fines that you achieve. You know, if you knew that by violating uh, something or doing it improperly and letting somebody through, it was a, it was a fixed sum, 100 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 10,000, you could do something. But if you let one Osama bin Laden through, uh, you'll be getting a billion. And so it, it, you're unable to say, but at the time I didn't know, I was trying to do my best, I may have messed up. So we're seeing a lot, of, I think, of this difficulty that, red flags mean uh, tick bashing, and then that means uh, rigidity, whereas we can't really have the discussion. So there's a lot there. But let me move on to a couple of other points um, here before we finish. Um, Graham, there's a quick one for you uh, from Tim Connell. Charles Bowman, as Lord Mayor in 2018, launched the Business of Trust with the Civic Principles. Is that still being moved forward, or was it just another initiative? Right, it's still it's still going forward. In fact, uh, both Peter Eslin, uh, who's the late Lord Mayor, and 
William Russell, who's the present Lord Mayor, have, have carried that forward within their own uh, aspects. So that trust is, I think trust is a, a key element anywhere. I mean, accountants call themselves the trusted advisor. And without trust, you cannot go forward. But the trouble is that the, the regulations don't allow for trust. They, they uh, allow for um, absolutes. And of course, absolutes are not where we are. Uh, when you're talking about real people. Um, so I'm going to turn to each of you in a second, just a, a reminder to, to ask you uh, really for your kind of single biggest thing on your wish list, what would you most recommend to strengthen the AML or to simplify it? And while you're pondering, I, I just can't resist uh, picking up a point that Martin Watkins has made. Uh, he's taking uh, Mark Spofforth's point of the cost to onboard a client versus the profit of performing a service for them. So doesn't this draw the attention of criminals to targeting low-value, high-volume crime to evade detection? I, I thought it's great to see uh, to see supply and demand functions uh, here on our session today. Anyway, if I could, I'll take this, if I might, in reverse order then. Mark, your, your, uh, your most uh, desired change to the system. I, I think I'd repeat what I said earlier on, that I think we have to share information about how the criminals are currently getting away with it, um, far better between the law enforcement side, uh, the private sector, the professions, and the supervisory bodies. I, I think we are very good at looking at the theoretical framework here, and we're very poor at learning lessons from practical examples. And Heather? Uh, I think I would like to see... Uh detailed review of what works and what does not work in the current uh, uh, arrangements because there are some things that just seem so unnecessary like requiring a sole practitioner to write down his policies and procedures uh, um, when they say well it's all in my head you know why do I need to write it down there's some things that just seem to be bureaucratic without any real achievement so a review what works what's unnecessary and, and then move on from there. Is there anybody you know conducting that at the moment or assembling something like that? Not that I'm aware of. Um, no, I can't, I can't think. I'm not aware of that that's on, on the table at the moment. Okay. And Graham, your, your thought? Well, I, I, both the, the two previous speakers have taken both my first thoughts, my third thought, if you, if you will, is uh, I would like to think that the particularly the legacy banks here in the UK and those in the city uh, have sat up and listened and are actually are going to do something to think about the processes and listen to the the, uh, the points, particularly the ones that Mark and Heather were making earlier, and actually uh, get down and start thinking. We don't want a tick box. We want to have business. Uh, we want to get this process. How do we make it actually work in practice? Well, um, folks, it's been, uh, we've run over a little bit, but I think it was well worth it. Um, I would summarize as it's been great to get uh, both Mark and Heather providing us uh, with the perspectives of real tax advisors and, and real accountants. Uh, I gather uh, genuine frustration but frustration in the sense of wanting to improve things and i think that is what you graham are doing so well is getting this task force going and i hope that we can perhaps have all three of you back uh, in the future as we nudge this forward hopefully into some concrete suggestions uh, as the task force moves forward it falls to me i'm afraid to say thank you to our sponsors for doing uh, some really tremendous stuff and letting us range so widely and broadly and a reminder that Graham is hoping to organize as soon as next month uh, another webinar, hopefully with the government view, but certainly uh, more webinars on how we can take this task force and get the message out there and come up with some con concrete suggestions for improvement. So I'm afraid it falls to me uh, to say thank you uh, virtually on behalf of the audience. So thanks to the three of you for your excellent contributions today and look forward to seeing all of you uh, sometime again soon.